Hello and welcome to ID Talk, Answers from an Infectious Disease Expert. I'm Dr. Sean Elliott, a Pediatric Infectious Disease Specialist with Tucson Medical Center, Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, and leader at the Arizona Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. This podcast has been created to answer questions from our chapter's members about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the first week of December. Today is December 1st. In the United States, as of about one hour ago, we have 13.7 million total U.S. cases and almost 270,000 deaths. According then to the most recent AAP data, which is as of November 26th, total number of U.S. cases of COVID-19 in children is 1.3 million, uh, which is 12% of the total positive cases in Arizona specifically. A cumulative total of 47,344 patients, which is 15%, 1,5% of the total. This comes out to a cumulative rate of 2,575 cases per 100,000 uh, Arizona children, which compares to the national average of 1,777 cases uh, per 100,000. Although this number is higher than it has been, we actually are lower in rankings in the rest of the country than we were before. In fact, Arizona is down now to number 14 versus where we were before, which was number one, two, and three for, well, actually almost six weeks running. So that's the good news, bad news uh, uh, news, of course, because we are certainly increasing cases countrywide. Arizona absolutely is in the middle of its third surge, and our numbers are still climbing. So we can anticipate the numbers to, to, to worsen. However, in comparison to other parts of the country, and specifically looking at our cases from birth through 20, which again uh, is where the, the pediatric data comes from, uh, our numbers are, are sort of in, in the middle third or so of the country. So again, some great questions coming through to us this week uh, to talk about. A fair number of these have to do with screening and where we're at. So I'll go ahead and answer these today, December 1st, with the understanding that in the next week or so, the CDC may be changing its recommendations about quarantine and screening practices. So the first questions that come to us, uh, are there any updates on whether asymptomatic school-aged siblings need to stay home in quarantine if one of the children at home is suspected of COVID but the swab is pending? Well, so this, this still falls under the CDC quarantine guidelines, which is any contact of a confirmed or strongly suspected COVID-19 case needs to stay home for 14 days from the time of last contact with that person. So assuming that the child at home is suspected of COVID but not yet confirmed, that counts. So any child is going to need to stay at home in quarantine regardless of whether they are asymptomatic or not. And swabbing that child, that asymptomatic contact of the index case, does not make a difference. Similarly, if the index case at home is swab positive for COVID-19, that merely confirms the exposure. So as of right now today, the recommendation by CDC is 14 days quarantine regardless of any additional testing for the contacts, the child contacts, the adults, whomever else is at home of the index patient. Now, this may change, and this is based on emerging data, that the expression of culturable, meaning contagious virus, from the, the respiratory droplets, from the nares, from the, the respiratory tree of index patients is only lasting about five days after onset of symptoms versus the up to 14 or 21 days or even weeks to months that that had been proposed previously. Because of this, it appears that CDC is strongly considering changing the quarantine recommendation for contacts to being seven or most 10 days of quarantine from point or last last point of contact with the index patient if that patient then has negative testing. So it looks like we may start to include the, the impact of negative testing. No word yet on whether that testing is, is antigen-based, uh, which as we know has a fairly high false negative and also a false positive rate, um, or whether it would need to be PCR-based, which will be a more sensitive and, and specific test. So, so again, as I said, take, take my answers with a little grain of salt, and, and I may be backtracking on this or changing it the next time uh, we, we uh, broadcast this podcast. Um, so that, that's the question one. Question two, uh, in a similar vein, is in regard to screening 
uh, as requested by school districts or, or perhaps anybody else, of asymptomatic children while those children are on a 14-day quarantine. And it, it certainly appears, and I've heard from others in, in the local area, that um, there are school districts and, and others requesting testing on asymptomatic children currently on their 14-day quarantine for purposes of disease surveillance at the school. Now, the testing is not necessary from a quarantine perspective, uh, nor is it necessary from a health perspective, but in terms of a case contact perspective and to help the schools in their own protocol for managing uh, possible index patients, it may be beneficial. If you look at it from the, cool, uh, the school's perspective, uh, you can see how it makes sense. All right, patient A is a known positive. Um, the other children are home now quarantining because of the contact at school. But what if some of those children also themselves are positive? Might that also broaden uh, the area of contact investigation? Perhaps, say, if the, the two different children are, are on different school buses, for example, or, or have different after-school activities. So I, I obviously am not here to tell us which way to go with that, but uh, it seems reasonable to honor the request of the school districts to perform the testing to help them with their disease surveillance. That, that does make sense. What about screening kids at home uh, who may be a sibling of the quarantine child but asymptomatic? Well, if they are, even if they are asymptomatic and are also a child or sibling exposed to an index case, they have to stay at home under quarantine right now for 14 days regardless uh, from the point of last contact with the infected person. Now, here's the real rub. Um, that 14 days may turn into a lot longer if the, the asymptomatic siblings, for example, are unable to home isolate from their sibling who is a positive index patient. Because let, let's, let's say uh, the family uh, has very little resources, they're in a one room bedroom apartment, and there's no way to avoid being in the same space with the index patient. That means the index patient is considered contagious for 10 days after onset of their symptoms, and then the clock starts ticking for the 14 days point of contact uh, with the, the index patient who no longer is contagious. So potentially, the, these are kids who are going to be prevented from doing in-person school up to 24 days. So this is not a small thing. Hopefully, we can get some further guidance from the CDC regarding the length of that exposure, uh, I'm sorry, length of that, that quarantine, both for, for the, the asymptomatic exposed child and also for the child who themselves is the index patient. So, so that, that's where we kind of stand with, with screening. Um, the next thing has to do with, with uh, looking at or, or guide, how to guide entrance of uh, patients coming into the clinic, into the practice, for sick visits or, or well care visits, and, and how do we or should we uh, perform screening? And as part of this question, um, uh, the, the questioner is also alluding to the evidence we have, which is that children under age 10 are, are lower risk to transmit disease uh, than our adolescents and, and middle schoolers. And, and that, that remains true. However, the, the, the two scenarios given to us uh, may or may not really rely on that, that difference. So uh, in order to keep um, the clinic, the staff, other patients safe, what screening, if any, is reasonable for the patient who is an 18-month-old with fever, cough, cold symptoms, and crying with a painful ear. So obviously we're all suspicious of acute otitis media, uh, although there could potentially be COVID-19 in that situation, but the sick visit is, is far more likely for some other process. In that case, unless there's a known exposure uh, to COVID-19, and this can be done by, by over the phone screening, it is reasonable for that 18 month old to come to the clinic, be evaluated, be treated, et cetera, and so forth. What about the 15-year-old asymptomatic patient who's coming in for her sports physical um, or vaccine update or, or insert the, the routine regular cause for an adolescent to come into the practice? Once again, if there is no known exposure at home or elsewhere to COVID-19, no screening is necessary. That, that adolescent can come to the practice with no concerns whatsoever. I think it is prudent for all of us to continue symptom screening, either at, at the, the front office uh, or uh, if your practice is to, to phone triage uh, from the parking lot. That remains, that remains reasonable. But, but at this point, I guess in general, as a, a general rule of thumb, screening is, is not 
going to be very beneficial to guide which patients to let or to bring into the practice, into the clinic, uh, versus those uh, which are not. Symptom screening, that, that, that may be reasonable, um, but it's really symptom screening in the setting of COVID exposure or, or not. Um, okay, the, the next uh, two questions have to do with vaccinations. Um, so what are the possible side effects of the COVID-19 vaccination? Well, um, I can speak from personal experience as a vaccine recipient or presumed vaccine recipient in the Moderna trial. Uh, this was uh, one of two messenger RNA vaccines. And, and I, I'm here to say that there is a fair amount of injection site pain. Uh, for those of us old enough to have received the, the adult Shingrix shot, the, the adult uh, zoster or, or varicella zoster shot, um, th this was similar in pain. Uh, some definite point tenders to that. And after the second injection, keeping in mind that the messenger RNA vaccines are a two-shot series spaced by three to four weeks. After the, the second injection, uh, I and others that I am fairly confident received vaccine in the trial had a, a good solid 24 hours of flu-like illness. Uh, Low-grade fevers with uh, definite rigors, uh, with myalgias, malaise. Uh, some have experienced uh, some nausea and emesis. So, so, so it's, it's 24 hours of being quite aware that something went down and, and it definitely occurs within six to eight hours after the second injection. So for, for those of us who, who may be uh, in line uh, and appropriately so, to be vaccinated uh, with the messenger RNA vaccines, uh, which will be the first two to be released in the United States, anticipate uh, giving yourself 24 hours off of, of clinical duties uh, after the second injection, if at all possible. The first one, I think most people just feel injection site pain and maybe a little off for a day or so, um, but, but nothing significant. Uh, and that indeed is what is being broadcast or, or, or released uh, from both Pfizer and Moderna, uh, the, the manufacturers of the two messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, and, and that is uh, injection site tenderness uh, and, and mild to at most moderate flu-like illness lasting truly for, for no more than 24 hours. Now, for the AstraZeneca product and the Janssen, the, the Johnson & Johnson subsidiary product, both of those are the uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines, um, which, which uh, promote a response to the spike protein as well. There, we, we don't have as much information, only because those trials have not yet concluded, nor have they released their initial safety data. However, preliminary reports for phase one and phase two trials uh, in both of those vaccine products uh, are similar, that, that there is a, a uh, injection site tenderness, um, no way of knowing if it's the same, different, better, worse than that with the messenger RNA, but uh, some injection site tenderness and some flu-like illness following. The good thing, I suppose, is that the Janssen Pharmaceuticals, the Johnson & Johnson subsidiary, uh, is a single-shot series, or single-shot, period, not a series about it. So hopefully uh, one might experience only some mild discomfort after that one and, and then pre be protected going forward. I have no way of predicting um, how various people will react to this, um, to the messenger RNA vaccines. In terms of timing, uh, this hasn't been asked, but I imagine we are all asking it. When can we anticipate vaccines coming to Arizona? And my answer based on just what's being released nationally is sometime in the next one and a half to two weeks. So the Pfizer product already has been submitted to the FDA a week ago. FDA was promising a two-week turnaround to grant emergency use authorization. Uh, meanwhile, Pfizer has been uh, manufacturing millions of doses with an intended release to the state health departments and subsequently to the county health departments for vaccination based on priority schedules created locally. Moderna and the NIH went to the uh, FDA yesterday, uh, that, that being November 30th, uh, to petition for emergency use authorization with, again, the same anticipated uh, two-week turnaround time. Similarly, Moderna has been manufacturing millions of doses as well. So as it currently stands, it looks like we may be seeing vaccines delivered to Arizona by mid-December uh, with anticipated vaccination of first responders, of uh, uh, people who are primarily caring for COVID-19 known or suspected patients, basically the, the ones who are first in harm's way. We can anticipate that being conducted and concluded before the end of the year. So it's coming, it's coming soon. Um, and after that, uh, a second wave of vaccines 
would be anticipated to be sent out uh, as early as mid-January and then provided to the second tier of vaccine recipients. The last question that I have to answer for all of us is, why would the participants in the AstraZeneca trial who received the half dose of that first shot have uh, better protection and, and potentially more antibody protection than those who received the full dose for, for both shots? Boy, you asked the million dollar question. Uh, a lot of people are asking that question and unfortunately, I don't have uh, a holy grail answer for you. I, I have a couple observations though. The first is that the, the recipients of the half dose, first of all, that that was an accident. It was not supposed to have been that way. It was certainly not planned. And there were not that many individuals. So keeping in mind, with a prospective observational trial, looking at a single product, um, even one compared to placebo, that the smaller the N, the smaller the number of people who receive that, the more likely that that random occurrences uh, can gain statistical significance. So sorry to throw a little biostats at you, but it's important to understand that the small number of patients, and we're, here we're talking just a few thousand, I think 5,000 people, who received the half dose and had apparently a 90% efficacy experience of the vaccine, for whatever reason may may represent a statistical anomaly, may simply resent, represent random error, uh, which allows them to appear to be better protected. When in fact, the true protective efficacy is more similar to those who, A, underwent the planned dosing, the full doses for both uh, vaccine shots, and then were part of the actual trial as it was, as it was plotted out. So that, that's one. Two, um, the other possibility may be um, that um, the ideal dosing for that specific vaccine product is not yet known. It is certainly possible to provide too much antigen, too much trigger for the adaptive immune system, uh, which then sort of binds itself out of action and fails to, to respond at the peak of full efficacy. Now, one would think that the dosing of the vaccine delivery would have been identified earlier prior to a phase three trial, uh, but it may be that even those vaccine trials had not yet tested all the doses and maybe not have been quite quite so so um, bold as to try and administer a half dose. So, so that there is that potentially as well. Um, certainly providing too little antigen is not sufficient, but most people don't realize providing too much antigen similarly can, can bind out the response and, and limit or, or mute the, the adaptive response. Uh, of the two, uh, I, I would prefer to think the second one is more scientifically plausible, uh, only because random error only goes so far uh, in challenging this, the biostatistical significance of a finding. But this is all simply hypothetical uh, on the part of Sean P. Elliott, so take what I say with a huge rock of salt. I don't know the answer. And at this point, if anybody does know the answer, they have not released it for, for common consumption or, or, or publication. So folks, that, that, that's where we stand. I, I don't have, um, thankfully, much more to offer in terms of clinical updates. Um, the number of patients, ex children experiencing multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, the MISCIs, ha have really plateaued both in Arizona as well as nationally. This may be uh, associated with a perceived decrease in virulence of COVID-19 across the country and across the world as well. Why might that be? Obviously, the, the first answer is that we're, we're getting better at recognizing uh, and intervening earlier or treating COVID-19 with steroids, potentially with remdesivir, the, the antiviral drug. But there is a suggestion that as the, the virus mutates and or as the most susceptible individuals have now already been infected and either uh, uh, succumbed to the disease or, or, or healed, that the remaining of the population is experiencing a uh, slightly milder disease. Certainly in terms of the triggering of the inflammatory burst or the cytokine storm that some have discussed, those numbers, those, those patients experiencing this severe onset disease and severe inflammatory disease do appear to be decreasing somewhat. Obviously, it's, it's, it's still an ongoing huge concern in the adult po patient population, but in pediatrics, uh, we've just not been seeing, knock on wood, as many children as before with MISCI or with severe disease. So fingers crossed that that continues to be a, a trend. I think perhaps the, the bigger news once the patients get and, and survive their COVID-19 is the post-COVID uh, syndrome. 
And the further we get into the pandemic, the more experience we get from prospective descriptional or observational studies. A good third of COVID-19 survivors, both adults and, and, and uh, pediatric patients, are experiencing some degree of post-COVID survival symptoms. A majority of these are ongoing significant or severe fatigue, uh, potentially accompanied with the so-called foggy brain. Uh, a concerning report in the last couple of weeks came to us from our psychiatric colleagues in that 20% of uh, COVID survivors are experiencing diagnosable psychiatric diseases, including depression and anxiety syndromes, uh, suicidality, uh, and also uh, there's a significant increase in patients, especially older patients, experiencing dementia. So not as much of a concern in pediatrics for the dementia component, but certainly uh, uh, cognitive concern or cognitive fogginess, uh, depression, anxiety, which of course are huge concerns in the pediatric population, uh, along with and, and probably accentuated by the social isolation that many of our pediatric patients are experiencing, this is a big deal. Uh, so I, I anticipate we, we can see an increase, uh, a significant increase in uh, our, our patients coming to us with uh, psychiatric and psychological concerns, uh, certainly with uh, a need to increase screening for significant major depressive episode, anxiety disorders, and, and suicide thoughts and ideation. That, that's a big thing. Although that is not good news, there is some good news in terms of the cardiac outcomes of post-COVID survivors. And whereas the initial reports were very concerning for significant post-COVID-19 cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, congestive heart failure, dysrhythmias, and, and all the, the attendant concerns, especially for our student athletes about being released to play uh, sports and, and then dropping on the field, those numbers and those estimates have been downestimated significantly as, as the denominator increases of patients in whom to test. So not, not that I would say willy-nilly every student athlete can return to their sport with, without concern, but just that our, our, uh, our approach, which is to screen for symptoms uh, of uh, chest pain or uh, palpitations or shortness of breath or exertional dyspnea or, or anything like that, that remains very appropriate. Uh, but these are things we would be doing anyway when we're conducting a sports physical. So at least regarding uh, cardiac health and outcomes, it seems that our standard practices remain appropriate and sufficient uh, to screen even for our patients who, who are COVID-19 survivors. So that is what I have to share with you uh, for, for this particular point in time. Again, and as always, thank you for listening to ID Talk. Arizona AAP members can submit questions for future episodes to COVID, C-O-V-I-D, at azaap.org. For more information and resources related to COVID-19 in Arizona, or to learn how to become a member, please visit us at azaap.org. In the meantime, hang in there, folks. Stay safe, stay sane, stay passionate, find the serenity wherever you can, and hang in there. Best to all of you. 